that is full time for his talk. It is not common that you have 90 miles up the road somebody uh, who it, it has been a leader in the field uh, that you would like to talk about at an energy seminar, uh, and he can just drive down in the morning and drive back in the afternoon, but that's what this gentleman has done in spite of the cold, and we should certainly appreciate it. Uh, he started out about uh, 35 years or 40 years ago as a laser jock and went to Lawrence Livermore Lab where he uh, was a key uh, cog in the development of the high power lasers that were developed at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And uh, in the middle 1990s, he was responsible for essentially selling the project that led to the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore Lab. Uh, as a result of that, he won a couple of awards for the, from the Department of Energy, and since he's using my computer, I can't read those awards to you, but uh, I can tell you one of them is the E.O. Lawrence Award, and it is the Lawrence Livermore Lab, so there's something high level there. Uh, he then went on to work uh, on nuclear reactors, fission reactors, for a few years at private companies, went to Sandia for a few years, and he is now the director at the, of the Laboratory of Laser Energetics at uh, University of Rochester. Uh, it is a very large laser lab that specializes in inertial confinement fusion and related research, and that's what we're going to hear about today. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. So uh, it's a pleasure to come here. Uh, Cornell's a wonderful university in a very beautiful location, but it was a little cold today coming down here. My, my windshield froze up and I couldn't see, so I was almost killed twice, but I'm here. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to talk about, as, as Dave said, my background, you know, uh, plasma physics and lasers, but I've been involved in a, a wide spectrum of energy research over my career, from biofuels to fusion, uh, you know, from things which are, you know, uh, biofuels gives you about uh, 10 gigajoules in a square meter in a year, and fusion, a gram of DT, if I burn it all up, will give me 400 gigajoules in an instant. So that whole spectrum of energy I've been involved in. So. I'm going to talk, my talk is going to be a lot about inertial fusion, but I'm going to start off with motivation of fusion and such and uh, tell you why ultimately it will be here and give you a sense of how hard it is. Uh, so first let me tell you a little bit about the University of Rochester's Labs for Laser Energetics. So we're funded by the, the DOE, Department of Energy, and uh, if you work for DOE, you always have to say, what are your missions, even though DOE is the largest uh, uh, funder of science in the country. You always have to talk about what, why, why should they give you money. So there's really six reasons why we do what we do. One is that we do uh, inertial fusion. That's what will be the bulk of my talk will be on inertial fusion, laser-driven inertial fusion, but there's other ways of doing it with pulse power and the like, which is a lot of that work is done here. A lot of the students that have come out of this university have become leaders in the field. Uh, but fusion is also, if you look at it, fusion, inertial fusion is... is uh, its goal is to get matter at extreme conditions. You know, fusion requires uh, material at hundreds of millions of degrees, and depending on how you do it, at very, very large densities. But um, it's a, it's a it's essentially it's an application of matter in the extreme. Now, of course, matter in the extreme happens lots of other places: center of the Earth, center of the stars, center of the the, the big planets. And one of the most interesting things that I think in science that's happened over the past 15, 20 years which is the sort of next step in the Copernican revolution, is the discovery of all these exoplanets. You know, the universe is filled with planets. And one day we'll take the next step and we'll find planets which have evidence of uh, complex life, and maybe one day ET will come. But nonetheless, studying these planets is a real important aspect of what we do because I, look at, I can look at a, uh, infer planets and such uh, you know, from a, uh, ob observational astronomy, but what are they composed of? I have some idea of their densities and such, but what's their internal structure? So what's matter look like when it's at tens of millions of atmospheres in the center of these big planets? So we can do that research on Earth. If you look back in the history of astronomy, spectroscopy played a major role in understanding stars. I mean, helium, why would you have, what's these lines that come from the sun? Well, what are they? Well, they're helium. So spectroscopy, x-ray and optical spectroscopy has been very important in understanding stars, and it will be important in understanding these planets too. And so, in the same way, looking at matter in extreme in the laboratory will help us understand the structure of these planets, 
you know, can they or do they have molten cores? Do they have things that can harbor complex life? So you're going to see, I think, over the next number of decades or so, a more uh, involved and, uh, of the facilities that were done initially for inertial fusion to be involved in other things. So we call that uh, high energy density physics. But think of fusion as one application. The other thing uh, we do is lasers. You know, the, the lab is laser for, laboratory for laser energetics. And so we make big lasers. Uh, and I invite any one of you here to come up for a tour, and we'll be more than happy to show all the stuff we do. And uh, last December, I happened to be in Stockholm because a Nobel Prize in physics was given to two people who uh, worked on lasers at the University of Rochester at the Laboratory for Laser Energetics. A graduate student, Donna Strickland, and her thesis advisor won the Nobel Prize for inventing what's called chirp pulse amplification. So we do a lot of laser work, obviously innovative there. We run lasers for users. Uh, we do about 3,000 experiments a year from laboratories all over the world. To come to, they come to use our, our lasers, and we do fusion work, we do high energy density work, we do a whole range of things. Uh, and that's an important part of what uh, we do for the, universe, for the uh, Department of Energy. Students, a lot of students here. It's a, you know, we are an educational institution, so we've graduated over 500 PhDs uh, since LLE was formed about uh, 300 from the uh, University of Rochester and 200 from other institutions because they come to these lasers to do their research. So we, right now we have about 140 students working at the laboratory, about 100 graduate students from Rochester and MIT, Princeton, Harvard, uh, uh, Michigan, other places, uh, and about 40 or so undergraduates. We also run a high school program. We get about 20 high school students from the area and uh, about 10% of them go on to win, uh, become scholars in this, uh, I, I call it the Intel Science Fair. Uh, and uh, we, so we go from high school all the way to PhDs and beyond. And then the other thing we do, this is a big enough facility capability, we train people. We train people to be leaders, not just PIs, which is an important thing, but we train people to run organizations, to do strategy, to, you know, to ma manage budgets of, si of size, to recruit and such. And so people get trained at Rochester and they go someplace else. The guy on your left, the smiling Charlie, his name's Charlie Verdon, uh, he was just nominated and now by President Trump, and he now serves in the, in the Department of Energy, and he is a, he is a chief scientist for the, what's called the, nuclear, the Stockpile Stewardship Program Nuclear Weapons. So he is uh, trained at Rochester. He spent 20 years at Rochester learning to design targets for fusion. And the guy on the right is David Meyerhofer, who's uh, 20 years at Rochester, and now runs the physics department at Los Alamos. So that's what we do. That's what LLE is. But now, now let me get on to other things. So let's talk about why are we interested in fusion? Who's, who wants to answer that question? All right. Well, energy powers the planet, right? I always like to show this, uh, all the different ways in which energy is used. And the quality of life is directly determined, I'll show you that in a minute, on the, our, on the per capita use of energy. And uh, we fight wars over energy. World War II, Japan attacked us because we stopped shipping oil to Japan. That was one of the major reasons. Uh, and it leads, leads to many, many things, not only quality of life, but global conflict. So it powers the planet, and we have to be able to see what the future will be. So uh, people at Livermore a long time ago divided this way of how can you characterize how important energy is in quality of life. So this is called the human uh, index. I forgot all the acronym, what it means. But it's, what it is, it's uh, GDP per, per capita, life expectancy, infant mortality, education. And they found it correlates very well with annual per capita electricity use. And one is it's just normalized. And so you see where the ones are, Canada, the US. And you see, but most of the world is down here. And over the, you know, the next uh, several decades and beyond, they want to move this direction. Right? You look at what has happened in China just in the past 20 years. It's remarkable. And so we're going to need a lot more energy and power than we presently have today. So right now, we have about 7.5 billion people. This is how much electricity we produce. 80% of the world's population is below uh, 0.8, and that's got to change. The always a question is, what will be in 2100? It's always hard to project to the future, right? So many things change. I would never have imagined that uh, my cell phone would be better than uh, James, T James Kirk's communicator in Star Trek, right? That's a, uh, we we'll never imagine that. But you can imagine sometime around the end of the century, we'll have maybe 9 billion people, and we'll need a lot more energy. And where is it going to come from? It's not, you know, fossil fuels are not the answer. Everyone knows that. I mean, uh, whether you believe in global climate change, there's anthropo you know, anthropogenic influence on it. I personally do. 
I've been to Beijing in a bad day, and I can sure see that the climate doesn't, mankind has not done very well there. I remember Los Angeles in the 60s, I, you know, reading about how bad it was. We got to change it. There's uh, Greenland over there. You see uh, the uh, ice melting. This is what it looks like when I mine coal. And of course, we fight wars over it. So, and 80% of the world's energy right now is produced by fossil fuels. It's going to change. So when you look at it, what do you want in the future? What sort of power do you want in the future? Right? You want something that's just that has to have adequate fuel supplies. Right? It's not going to run out. You know, you want it, we think we're going to be around here for a long time. So we want to make sure we have fuel supplies that are either renewable or abundant. It's going to be flexible. I live in California, and we have 1,000 miles of coastline, and yet we're always struggling for water. Right? It's going to have other uses other than electricity, transportation, obviously, water, process heat for an industry and the like. It has to be acceptable in the environment. It's obvious, right? I have grandchildren, grandchildren. I want them to have a better world than I do. It's got to be safe. You can't have a Chernobyl or a Fukushima. And it's got to be, and at least right now, and probably with it, it's got to be something affordable. And it's got to be consistent with political realities. I mean, for example, nuclear power suffers because people worry about proliferation. They worry about uh, how you deal with the waste. And if you're trying to you know, se sequester CO2, does anybody remember Lake Nyos? There was about 1,700 people killed because a CO2 bubble popped up from the lake and flowed down and killed, uh, looked like something from the Andromeda strain. So there's a lot of things you have to look at when you look at energy. So what do you want? I also draw cartoons. I copied uh, Homer here. You know, it's got to be, you also, there is no silver bullet. Anyone thinks there's one answer to energy is wrong. It's going to be a bunch of things. It's going to be increased efficiency. But when people, things are more efficient, people tend to buy more of them. So it's not always a simple answer. We got to conserve. I mean, you know, I don't need to have a, a, my a U, a SUV to go 10 mile, five miles to the, the drugstore. I should have something else. It's got to be distributed, improved distribution, smart grids and such. Storage, you know, the problem with renewables, as you know, is they're episodic. And also, they're located usually away from urban centers. Another thing which is very important, and this is where fusion and other stuff is, by 2050, the UN estimates 60% of the world's population will live in cities. They won't live in the country, live in cities. And uh, I live in San Diego, even though I work in Rochester, you can imagine why. Uh, I pay more for trans transmission costs than I do for energy generation, because California buys its energy from Arizona. And uh, PG&E, which is a, a utility up in Northern California, went bankrupt because the fires in California, many of them were started by arcing of transmission lines. So you need to have safe central power that can be located close to urban centers. And so that's where fusion comes in. You know, so what are the other features? I went through this already. It's got to be passively safe, obviously. All these things, all right? So this is, and so, now who knows, who, does anyone recognize that person? Dave, who is that person? That's right, remember, I draw cartoons. So you have to look into my cartoons. You have to say, that looks like a good cartoon. <laughs> so uh, I drew this for his 90th birthday, which looked like he was going to live forever. Uh, Teller is an interesting physicist, very controversial, but very smart. All right, so let's talk about fusion. Uh, that's Ricardo Betty. So Dave, he, it's a, an early picture of him. So Ricardo is one of the scientists at Livermore, I mean at, at Rochester. Uh, and of course, this is old Albert. Evan is my grandson, by the way. Okay, interesting, always a little history here. Fission and fusion were discovered essentially in the same decade. You know, one of the great challenges uh, in, in, I'll say, in uh, evolutionary biology in the late 19th century was how could the Earth be older than the sun? Because by that time, geologists and Darwin knew that evolution took lots of time. Geologists said the Earth is billions of years old, but how could the sun radi burn for billions of years? Well, it was a process. A few hundred million years from gravitational collapse, what happened? Well, luckily, quantum mechanics and nuclear physics came around in the 30s, and Hans Bethe, famous Cornell, you know, one of, one of the most famous uh, physicists in the 20th century, a wonderful man, a professor here for many years. He figured it out, and he won a Nobel Prize uh, for it. And then, of course, fission was discovered in the 1939 German laboratory. You know, so Bethe won it for understanding how stars work. Fission was discovered in the laboratory in 1939 by the Germans. Uh, and, of course, it's a room temperature process, so within three years, you had nuclear reactors being built for the Manhattan Project to build plutonium. Within a decade, you had nuclear power plants beginning as commercialization. They power about 20% of the electricity in the U.S. right now. 
uh, and uh, they power about 80 or 90 sub, uh, naval ships, uh, nuclear, uh, aircraft carriers and submarines. Fusion on the other side requires material at 100 million degrees. So we still don't have it. And it's been ongoing research since the 1950s and ongoing today. But that's, it's always remarkable when you look at these things were both discovered in the same decade and the, the challenges of one compared to the other. Why do we like fusion? Well, it's abundant. Right? The principal fuel beginning will be deuterium tritium. Deuterium is about one every 7,000 hydrogen atoms of deuterium from the Big Bang, got lots of it. Tritium can be produced from lithium, which is a very abundant material in the crust, light element. It can, ha can have a meltdown. Remember, it's 100 million degrees. Something goes wrong, it cools off, it stops. You never have an issue with uh, uh, the radioactive products and fission, which stay, remain hot and cause meltdowns and things like that. We'll never have that. There's no greenhouse gas or other dangerous affluents from it, of course. The reaction products by themselves, DT fusion, is, uh, produces a helium nuclei, you know, which is make balloons out of and uh, other stuff. Uh, and uh, a neutron. Now, the neutron, of course, is energetic. You know, the, the energy release per fusion is about a million times more than the chemical reaction. So that neutron is energetic and can cause activation of materials. But you have a, so a choice of selecting what those materials can be. And you can select materials that don't have, don't have half-lives of tens of thousands of years, but have half-lives of hundreds of years. And of course, you can make multiple products out of this just like you can. One of the things also is those neutrons can be used to transmit materials, transmute them, and so you can use them to get rid of nuclear waste if you wanted. Now, there's also lots of issues with that, but it's possible to do. And of course, the energy d density of fusion is so high that it doesn't take much of it to supply all the world's oil if we wanted to look at it in that simple way of a, a cubic kilometer. But it's hard. Why is it hard? It, you have to get material hot enough, these ions have to get hot enough so they get close enough so that the Coulomb repulsion can be overcome and a strong nuclear force can make them stick together. And that requires enormous amount of temperature. As you know, temperature is the average velocity, average energy. And so you have to get materials up to hundreds to millions of degrees and control it. That's the challenge. Uh, and it's why it's been taking us so long. And of course, there's no material structure that can do it, so it's got to be a fusion plasma, the fourth, matter, fourth state of matter. It works, right? There's the sun, works all the time, thank God. And thermonuclear weapons, we make fusion, although most, most of nuclear weapons come still from fusion, I mean from fission, but nuclear weapons have a very strong fusion component. And uh, this was done in 1952, and uh, we still have these things today. Uh, down here is, uh, does anyone like science fiction? I hope somebody does. One of the best movies done in the 50s, some really great classic science fiction movies in the 50s, one is called Forbidden Planet. Uh, and it's about a civilization that goes extinct overnight, not by nuclear weapons, but by creating the monsters of the id. But it has 8,000 cubic miles of fusion reactors in it. So it's got Robbie the Robot, synthetic music, it's wonderful. But it talks about fusion, the first time fusion was talked in a commercial sense. We don't have it yet. So there's two ways of doing it. Everyone, you have to create matter at these temperatures to be able to get reactions that take place. Uh, and the two ways, that, the most common ways right now, and there's other ways which we're looking at, but I'll show you the two extreme ways are magnetic fusion and inertial fusion. Now, there's a number up there which is always good to remember. What do I need to make fusion work? I need a pressure time product of about 10 atmosphere seconds. So I can make a plasma at 10 atmospheres, 100 million degrees, so it means it's not high density, like over here. So, you know, one hundred thousandths of atmospheric density, roughly. But I need then to hold a I need to have the energy confined for about a second. So I have to make this material at 100 million degrees and keep it around, keep the energy confined for about a second. The other extreme, and I do that with magnetic fields. So there's a big program in Europe called ITER, which is to build a giant tokamak, which I won't go into the, any of that, but it's a magnetic confined toroidal system invented by the Russians, actually by Andrei Sakharov and, and Igor Tom, who were uh, involved in the nuclear weapons program. Uh, and that's the worldwide uh, effort, and MFB is focused on that. On the other extreme is inertial fusion. Here what we do is don't make matter at 10 atmospheres, we make matter at billions of atmospheres. 100 billion atmospheres to beyond, the highest pressure we've done is almost 400 billion atmospheres. So when you do that, you don't have to hide, confine the plasma very long. It reacts so fast that the fusion occurs before the plasma is figured out, nothing is holding it here. It's inertia keeps it intact for a long enough time to meet, make net energy release. So ICF is the physics of the extreme. High pressures, high densities, 
short times, small scale. And so that's why I say this uh, ICF infusion really is a, an application of matter at extreme conditions. So now let's talk about what we do. So first of all, just to give you a sense of how high these pressures are, so if you had a little finger here and you put uh, a bunch of uh, aircraft carriers on it, you'd be able to, you know, holding all those on your fingers are the pressures that we have to generate in the laboratory. So it's pretty hard. Uh, and again, I went through all these thumbs here. The confinement time, again, is just the inertia, how long it takes this material to figure out that not, nothing is holding it and it blows itself up, but it's already reacted. You know, and uh, you need sources that can do this. I mean, you need sources that can deliver energy in a very rapid time and can concentrate the energy to do this. So here's the three major facilities in the United States. This is Omega. This is a facility at Rochester. Uh, it's about a 30 terawatt, 60-beam uh, UV laser. It produces the whole world. If you, took, if you measured every power output here and every car moving and every plane moving, the Earth generates instantaneously maybe about 10 to 11 terawatts. So for a brief instant of time, Omega doubles the world's power output. NIF, over the next one, is a 500 terawatt laser. Uh, and so it generates far more power than the rest of the world. But the lights don't go out because we only do it for nanoseconds. Uh, lasers compress energy in space and time. I'll talk about that in a minute. Then, of course, there's pulse power. Uh, some of the research was just done here in pulse power, the same sort of thing. This is the Z machine at Sandia, where many of the students, of day students and others, have gone there and have had played a major role uh, in the development of uh, inertial fusion and in higher density physics there. So they're the three major facilities in the US. I was like, when I give talks about lasers, I'm not going to, need to spend a lot about lasers. People say, what's the difference between a laser and a regular light source? Well, a laser, I always say, it's one, a laser is basically a disciplined military crowd all marching together, all coherent and uh, under strict control. And a normal light source is a, a, a panicked crowd. Well, so this allows us to focus light to extreme intensities, uh, small spot size, and extreme power. And so that's what lasers do. Uh, and that is why we are able to do inertial fusion, because you'll see in a minute why we need to have these conditions. So here's Omega. Again, it's about 30 terawatts. Now, I'm always talking, when, the, the, when you talk about inertial fusion against extreme, we talk about these enormous powers. But really, what they are, I had more energy for, for breakfast than these lasers produce, and so did you. If you, have a, if you have a Cosmo or Martini, you're probably consuming more energy than these lasers do, but you do it over a reasonable period of time. This does it in a nanosecond. And so it's energy concentration and time. So let's talk about how does ICF work. Uh, so here's, a, here's what a little target looks like. Uh, and so what it is, this is about a millimeter in size. So it's very small. Uh, it's, think of it as a spherical rock. What happens, we shine the laser beam on, this tar on the outside of this. This is a pi diagram, so it's a sphere. Uh, and it's composed of... Uh, a rocket fuel, which we call an ablator, and inside is the fusion fuel. Remember, we want to get the fusion fuel to very high density, so let's start off with the highest density we can. That means we make it cryogenic. So we start off with DT of about 200, two tenths of a gram per cc, and we want to co compress it to 500 grams or beyond c per cc, but we start off with the highest densities. And there's, again, there's a little bit of equilibrium gas in the middle, you know, because uh, these things are about 18 degrees Kelvin. The total mass is a milligram. If it was much more than that, when we, if we worked, we'd blow up the target chamber. We don't do that. So, uh, you know, at this sort of a, a densities or uh, this sort of mass, we can have a controlled reaction in a, a vessel which is uh, safe and secure. Uh, what happens, the light shines on it. It ablates the rocket fuel. Things of a spherical rocket. The plasma expands out at high velocity, and the reaction force compresses it. It makes an effective pressure. The pressures are typically 100 million atmospheres, 100 megabars is the pressure that's squeezing this capsule. Remember, compression is an amplification of, you know, compression amplifies the pressure. So this thing runs into itself, right, because it's all moving at, uh, when we finally get it going, it's going at, you know, a, a, a tenth of so, a tenth of a percent of light speed. It's moving very fast. And then when it runs into itself, all that kinetic energy is, is uh, if it's done right, converted into pressure. And that's how we could get the conditions of these extremes. And so uh, the typo, we will, when that's done, we will have matter at millions of degrees and densities, which are you know, hundreds of grams per cc. That's how it works, right? Like that. We call it, you know, it's against spherical rocket. Now, one of the nice things about ICF, or one of the, one of the features of ICF, 
as we counter the laser pulse, and I'll show in the view graphs a little bit later on, a very complicated way in time. Why is that? We want to tailor when this finally thing stagnates, we want to tailor what it looks like. Because we tried to heat all of that DT up, it would take too much energy. So we heat only a little bit of it up. This we call it, this is the hot spot right here. Uh, and that's where fusion starts. So remember, DT fusion makes helium, an alpha particle, and a neutron. The alpha particles are doubly ionized, and they stop in the plasma. They self-heat the plasma. So they ignite the plasma. So the laser can't do it. The fusion ignites itself. And so what happens here is that this thing, fusion, this is our, our 50, 100 million degrees here. It's surrounded by cold material, which we've compressed because we've made the laser pulse very, very special. So that material is, light, is basically near a Fermi degenerate gas. It's at very high densities but low temperatures. So you have this crazy sort of situation where you have you know, 50 million degrees here and less you know, temperatures which are 100 times less right next to it. And that's one of the challenges in ICF is to make that configuration happen. And what you do when that happens, one measure of uh, inertial fusion is you know, our, our confinement, we use a thing called ROR, the aerial density, the density radius product. And how much fusion fuel you burn up it's just like goes as a rho r over the rho r plus roughly six. So we can burn up in a, a, when we're successful about 30 to 40 percent of the DT undergoes fusion, which is much higher than a magnetic device, which is only a few percent. You can do it several different ways. You can shine a laser beam directly on it. That's called direct drive, not very clever. Or else you can shine it into a radiation case, which is called a whole room. Not exactly, it's a leaky thing that Max Planck won his Nobel Prize in the beginning of quantum mechanics. So we shine laser beams into the whole, this uh, cavity. This cavity is about a centimeter long. Inside there is a fusion capsule. Now that, this uh, oven, if you will, is heated to about 2 million degrees. Something at that temperature radiates x-rays. Those x-rays then impinge on the capsule and do the same process as laser light does. NIF does this primarily and Rochester does this primarily. Are x-rays black body radiation at 2 million degrees? Close, yes. It's close. It's about a 300 volt black body. All right, so here's what, now I'm going to focus on Omega. Here's what we do with Omega. Again, there's the target chamber. And again, you're all welcome to come anytime, and we'll give you a nice tour and show you all the details of what we do. So we make a little star you know, for a very brief instant of time. All right, so let me tell you where we are. How far are we from getting fusion in the laboratory? Well, we make fusion all the time in the laboratory, but we don't make more than, we use, than the energy we use to make it. That's the challenge. So we have a program, actually, that uses both the Omega laser and the NIF laser at Livermore. Uh, and what we do on Omega, am I going to get this right? Let's see. Yes. We do on Omega, we take targets, which are about, again, about a millimeter in diameter, and we do, we implode them to the conditions I told you about. So we study hydrodynamics, how do you form these targets, all the various things that go on in this achieving fusion conditions in these targets. But they're too small ever to ignite. Remember I told you the ignition or how much you burn up the fuel is related to the rho r plus rho over plus x. We nev never get enough rho r because we don't have enough mass. There's only a 30 kilojoule laser. Over here is NIF, and NIF uh, is a 2 megajoule laser. And what you do here is you hydrodynamically scale this. So this basically, you can imagine, this is you want to keep the same joules per gram because that's temperature and such. And so we have uh, 70 times more joules. We have 70 times more grams or mass. And so that, and so in the mass, basically, it goes as volume here, and so it's a cube root of the, energy, of the uh, energy. So the targets are about four times the size. This target would be something that would be shot on NIF. And so what we do is we study all the physics of implosion here, and we study all the things of how the laser light couples into this. Remember, I told you the light makes a plasma. Well, this, pla this light is very high intensity. I'll give you a sense of the intensity. The intensities are typically 10 to the 15 watts per square centimeter. Now, how high is that? That electric field with that intensity is what binds an electron to a proton in hydrogen. But we do it not over an angstrom, we do it over a millimeter. So it drives all, so what plasmas can do, having uh, electrons and ions, they can support waves because you have the Coulomb force, which is a long range force. It can excite waves and crazy things in the plasma. So we call it laser plasma interaction physics, which has been the bane of this program since it started. And it's very much dependent on the size of the plasma. Think of this, the plasma is an amplifier. The bigger the amplifier, the worse these things can happen. And so we have an amplifier. We have a plasma here about four times the size of this. 
So we have to worry about plasma physics here. I'm not going to talk much about that, but it's something which we have an active research program. And it's been actually a big problem in this field since its inception. So what we are doing on Omega now is we have a program on, uh, to try and get the best implosions we can possibly do. And I'm going to show you how we've done this. So we have basically a five-tiered uh, five, uh, approach here. We're trying to do what's the best we can do on the present facilities. We're continue, then we extrapolate the results here to, to NIF, and I'll show you about that. I'll show you these two things I'm going to focus on. We're constantly making the laser better. Uh, remember, NIF, this laser has 60 laser beams, and we can ba balance them all together over a few nanoseconds to uh, only a few percent. So these 60 laser beams are identical to a few percent on these time scales. And we put targets within about five microns of where they're supposed to be. And where innovation is what we're also doing. I'm not going to talk much about that. Then I'm not going to talk anything about the NIF experiments where we're really looking at how does the plasma work at these big scales. So this, this is an example uh, of uh, uh, the targets. I mean, here's a, actually a real target, real dimensions. This is a typical, you see the, this is diameter here, you know, about four, or radius about 400 microns. Here's the detail, it's about 15 microns thick, it's frozen, so it's 18 degrees C. Here's our rocket ablator. And here's a laser pulse. Remember I told you we have to create matter, not only these high pressures, but also with a very interesting spatial profile. So we do this by changing the laser pulse, it looks like this. This laser pulse will, I won't go into the details, will allow us to form a hot spot here and make this DT ice be very dense but cold. Because this is basically is our, fusion, our principal fusion fuel. So this is what it looks like. And so what we've done, there are two major parameters in the inertial fusion to look at. One is yield, how much neutrons you get out, obvious. The other one is how well you confine it. Because even though we don't confine it very long, we have to confine it for some level. And so the confinement parameter is rho r, is this density radius product. So when this thing is compressed, it would be the density, uh, the density here and the radius. So we have a program. I'm going to show you how we're doing this to basically get the best we can do. And it's a very interesting uh, approach, just published in Nature today. I'm going to tell you what we've tried to do. So the inertial fusion program has a history of numerical simulations. It goes back to the 50s of using the most advanced computer models to develop uh, the simulation tools to be able to predict experiments, because experiments are expensive and few and far between. And so we have lots of codes. And I'm going to give you an example of this. And so here's, if you look at what you can do, you can vary this target. You can vary all the parameters here. You can change all the different characteristics of this laser pulse. If you go through all the variations you can do, there's tens and tens of variations. And they lead to many, 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 many different target uh, uh, opportunities. So what would you do? We, we have a, a code here. I'm going to say we have a one dimension. We use a one dimensional code here. Now, one dimensional code does all the hydrodynamics, the laser coupling, all these things. Uh, and it produces, uh, it predicts a yield, produces an implosion velocity, how fast this, this rocket is moving, produces a, you know, this confinement product, ion temperature, confinement type, all these various things. But when you do experiments, you get, you also get these, these uh, observables, but they're now observables. They are not computer predictions, they are actually measurements. And the question is, is there a correlation between them? Hopefully the answer is yes. If you had an ideal code, these would be exactly the same, but you don't. So what we've done, as we've mapped on all the experimental parameters to these parameters to give us a predictive tool. So we're using machine learning, actually, of the experiments are telling us how you should do experiments. The experiments tell us how to do experiments. They tell the code how to do experiments. And now we've used this to optimize the program. Now, when I told you this is a one-dimensional code, so you say, well, the world is three-dimensional. But the Omega laser is extremely reproducible. And we found out right now we think three-dimensional effects are systematic. They're always the same. So we actually uh, don't have to uh, deal with these directly. But we hope that, that the mapping here will tell us what three-dimensional effects are in the, that we have to play with in the future. So here's an example of uh, what we have done. These are different targets, uh, you know, again, different sizes, different laser pulses. And you see the dots here? There, there are predictions and the experiments. And so in the past year, we've increased the yield by a factor of three. And we've increased the compression by 65% using this technique. So it's a machine learning tool applied to fusion, which is uh, one of the first times that's been done. And uh, this is something which uh, I said was just published in Nature just uh, today. And the first author is a graduate student. So here's an example of uh, the row R's. This is our modeling prediction, and here's the data. And uh, this is the type of laser pulse we, we had to do this. If you look at, this laser pulse looks a little bit different than what I showed before, because look at the dip in the middle. 
the, the machine learning told us a dip in the middle was a better way of doing it, and it worked. And so uh, it was a great surprise to me, and I had to take these guys out for dinner after we did the experiment. So one of the things that we do, we take these, these results and take them, what if we had to do this on NIF? Remember, NIF is big enough, it's called the National Ignition Facility because it's trying to explore ignition physics. So we, what we do now is take these results and then scale them hydrodynamically to NIF. What would it give us? So what does hydrodynamic scaling mean? It means you, you, the target's moving at the same speed. The adiabat is the same compressibility, don't worry about that. It's got the same pressure uh, and densities. Mass and volume scale with energy, right? Joules per gram is the same. Uh, and that means that the laser couples the same energy to the target. And all the non-uniformities, the, non the three-dimensional things, scale with size, which is actually very conservative because they're better as you get bigger. The NIF targets have the same non-uniformities that we have on Omega. So they're four times better than, we, than uh, we have on Omega for the same scale size. Doesn't have this, remember, this laser plasma reaction physics. We have to learn this on NIF, and that's what we're doing. And so this program together is uh, the way we're trying to do an integrated direct drive program for fusion. So I'll give an example of what happens. So here's, this is an Omega experiment uh, with all the non-uniformities in it now. Uh, this is a final compressed state. This is a dense shell. You see this is the, where the hot spot is, and this is where the dense target is. And you see it's not just a shell. There's three-dimensional features here. These are hydrodynamically unstable. Again, I won't go into that detail. When you take your hydrodynamics course, you'll learn all about Raleigh Taylor and stability and things. And if you scale, this, this is what it would look like at NIF. And you see it's just a factor of four bigger. And what does it give? It gives, if you look at it, uh, this is a complicated picture, but what happens is if we did the same experiment on, um, on, that we've done Omega on NIF, we get about 700 kilojoules of fusion. It would have a gain of about a little bit more than a quarter. So it's close to having break even. Uh, and uh, there's a parameter in here. Remember I told you you need 10 atmosphere seconds to get fusion to work? Well, we have 80% of that. So we're close. Uh, and so I'm, you know, I'm, I, as, as Dave said, I was very much involved in NIF, and at that time we had to go a long way to build a two megajoule laser. I am more confident today that we'll eventually get ignition on the facilities of this scale, but we still have a lot of work to do, and this is an example of the progress. But one of the things, and I think this is where you know, perhaps the future of Cornell and such would be, we have to have innovation here. Remember, this, this is plasma physics, and plasmas like magnetic fields. They like electric fields. Well, we're trying to avoid magnetic fields. Well, we're going to do magnetic fields in the future. We're going to try and have magnetic fields help us. Uh, we have a program here actually imploding cylinders. Uh, that very interesting. We've done that with Sandia. And we think that if we magnetize our targets, we have a chance of achieving ignition even where we are right now without any further improvements. But that remains to be seen. So innovation is something which I want to encourage. Here's an example. I hope this works. Let's see, does it work? No, it doesn't work. This is, a, this is actually a cylindrical plasma. I'm going to show you this actually. If it had worked as it was supposed to, to show you a cylinder imploding, you would actually see a line here of hot, dense plasma that's magnetized, uh, yeah. and that actually produces lots of interesting fusion yields. So there's, spheres are not the only way to do inertial fusion. I'm going to talk a little bit about laser research at Rochester. Change the topic. So innovation in lasers leads to lots of new things. So this is the Nobel Prize that was just done uh, this in December. There's my smiling face here. This is Donna Strickland. She was the graduate student who did the research to get her a Nobel Prize. Only the third woman in all of uh, Nobel history who has won a prize in physics, and the first one in 55 years. So you women in the audience start getting some more Nobel Prizes for us. Uh, and here's actually, uh, we took their, their uh, uh, technology, and while I was at Livermore, we made the world's first petawatt laser. So a petawatt laser is 10 to the 15 watts. Uh, and you can focus this to uh, you know, intensities which are five, almost 10 orders of magnitude higher than we do right today. And this is a picture of uh, Charlie Towns. Anyone know who Charlie Towns is? Nobel Prize for inventing the laser. That's Charlie standing right next to, uh, essentially, a student of mine, Mike Perry. We did the first petawatt. So Charlie was amazed that within, nine, this was done in, within 30 years of, his inv of the invention, a demonstration of the laser, that it had gone from milliwatts to petawatts. Shows you how much advance can take place over time. So what we're doing right now is uh, research to make better lasers for inertial fusion. So the, 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 we've had essentially, this is where we are today, third generation lasers. First generation lasers in this field were the high-powered lasers of the time in the early 70s. That was CO2 and neodymium glass. 
CO2 operates at 10 microns, and neodymium glass operates at a, about one micron. We found out that the plasmas didn't like this. So this plasma physics that I mentioned to you before went haywire when we did these lasers. And so the program had a major, major problems. And here's a, an old CO2 laser, which is also could be used as an apartment. If you ever go to Los Alamos in the, the area of the physics, you can find you need a place to stay. You can stay inside that amplifier. And that's me standing next to it. What happened, we, we found out one of the things that's important in plasma physics with lasers, there's a parameter called the intensity times the wavelength squared over the temperature. That's an important parameter to tell you how much plasma physics will get in the way. So remember, I need intensity, because that's how I implode this rocket. And so what I do to get rid of this, make the I lambda squared smaller, I make the lambda smaller. Thank God that uh, nature had made nonlinear optics, and the materials industry had made big nonlinear optics. So we could take the laser here, which was a one micron laser, and convert it into the ultraviolet. So we tripled its frequency with high efficiency. Uh, and that's with the Nova laser at Livermore. What we did afterwards uh, is that these lasers are still too coherent. They have a lot of, their coherence also drives coherent problems in the plasma, so let's make the lasers less coherent. So we destroyed the spatial coherence. Because remember, these targets are a millimeter, the diffraction limited spot is about five microns. We don't need to do that, so we need to break up the spatial coherence and make them focusable on a much bigger distance. What we're doing now is we're going to make them broadband lasers. So we're going to now destroy the temporal coherence. So we have an active program at Rochester right now to destroy the, opt the, opt the temporal coherence, and we think this will lead to fourth generation lasers. What we're also doing, uh, this Nobel Prize was, was done for inventing this thing called chirp pulse amplification, which made very, very intense lasers. Uh, there was a, pro a, a report from the National Academy of Sciences, just came out about a year ago, a little over a year ago, saying this is a great idea, and Europe has, defined, Europe has decided it's really a great idea, so they're doing all the work in it now, and so is China. And the U.S., which started the field, is losing it. So we are now uh, working with a community to let's make the world's biggest laser in terms of peak power. So we have a, our, a laser at Omega called Omega EP, which is, on, again, you'll see it, one of our big lasers. And we can actually use this as a way of making another laser. We can think called optical parametric amplifier. I don't have to know about it. We use a laser to make a laser. And we can make this laser to make not one petawatt laser, but 30 petawatt lasers. So we can actually make two 30 petawatt lasers. And you can do nuclear physics with this. So you can do radiation, lots and lots of things, relativistic plasma physics. The electrons are highly relativistic. You make electron positron plasmas, fully, uh, fully, you know, your plasma is complete, electron positron, lots and lots of interesting things. The electrons and even the ions are relativistic. So interesting stuff in the laboratory. So uh, this is, there's a workshop coming in a, about a, two months where we're going to talk about this more. And I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the interesting things about this type of fusion research. There's lots of different things you do with it. Here we are right now. And we, you know, one of the principal funding for this is to maintain the nuclear arsenal without testing. Now, I grew up, I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. I, no one, I think, in this room likes nuclear weapons, but they exist. We haven't tested nuclear weapons since 1992. And we have, but you must maintain the expertise, not only to make sure that your nuclear weapons work, which you hope never, never, never to use, but to make sure what's North Korea doing, what's Russia and other players doing. So you need expertise and people. And the Stockpile Stewardship Program does this. This is a big support of the program. It has some controversy, but I'm more than happy to challenge anyone to the, why you need it. Of course, you do the science. I didn't talk about uh, studying the interiors of Jupiter and other planets with the same sort of physics. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. You can actually do uh, lithography. You make computer chips with this technology. And of course, energy in the long term. And so this is the spin-off technology are very, very important in terms of what goes on uh, in, uh, uh, in this field. So what we're doing at, at the University of Rochester is actually making a whole curriculum on the science. So uh, you have these facilities that we've talked about. You have high performance computing, diagnostics, and other things. And we're going to basically uh, use these to look at how not just fusion, but what can you do in other areas of science. So I'm going to show you one example. It was done with pulse power, actually. This is a temperature density plot. So this is a, you know, plasmas. What we can do with these facilities is very interesting. These types of lasers and pulse power can make matter under a range of conditions. They can make relatively cold plasmas. They can make dense plasma, they can hot plasmas. And so you can study different phenomena here, uh, you know, looking at stars, obviously fusion way up here. There's tokamaks. 
but you can do lots of you can look at planets, you can look at stars, and well, some very nice work that was done uh, at Sandia, making matter at about 150 electron volts. I mean, electron volts about 10,000 degrees, and densities. And this is near the in the tier of the sun where it goes from radiation to convection. And so one of the uh, you know understanding the sun is understanding what how does energy flow in this fusion machine, and of course radiation is a part of that. And so iron is a constituent in the sun from fusion and, and uh, other things going on in the past. And what we've done here, what Sandia has done, is look at X-ray emission as a function of frequency at these conditions. They found out it doesn't agree with what we thought it did. And so right away, this is close. This has uh, been a big issue right now of trying to understand. Maybe we don't understand the opacity of the atomic physics of uh, atoms like iron, which have a much bigger importance in how the sun works and how energy flows through it. Now, this, uh, this uh, research won. Uh, every year, DOE has a major award called the Dawson Award for the most innovative or important experiment. And this uh, won that Dawson Award a couple years ago because it was so innovative and actually so important for the broader field. So science, this is all from fusion, the technology, but allows you other things. This is actually making computer chips. How does fusion connect to computer chips? Well, it turns out we make measurements of x-rays. We have x-ray mirrors, x-ray optics to image this, these uh, sources onto detectors. Well, it turns out that's how you make lithography. How lithography is you have a per pattern of a circuit, you shine a laser on it, then you demagnify it with optics onto a, a photoresist, and then you make computer chips. Well, right now it's done with 1,900 angstrom radiation. You all know from your elementary physics classes, the shorter the wavelength, the smaller diffraction size is, and the smaller feature sizes you can make. So it's done now with uh, XMR lasers at 1,900 angstroms. I can make laser produce x rays just like I did before. Uh, and now I can do this not at 1,900 angstroms, but at 100 angstroms. So this is called extreme ultraviolet lithography. It's, uh, there's, a, this is, there's a machine actually at uh, SUNY Albany. These are about $100 million steppers to make the computer chips. And they will be making computer chips with, with the minimum sizes of 7 nanometers, 70 angstroms. And that came out of fusion research. Who would ever have thought that? So one of the things that you know, I've always been interested in this field is and I think in an academic setting, there are lots and lots of things that will come out of the science and technology beyond fusion. But what about fusion energy? That's what I came here to talk about, right? So once you've demonstrated ignition in, in the laboratory, you will have a fusion program. Now, you remember, Dave, you know who this is, right? Mm -hmm. John Sathian. So you have, you know, if you look at the history of science in this country, many things come out of national security. I don't use a map anymore. Right? I have GPS. GPS was developed for precision weapons in the military. I never had map. And so a lot of things started for different reasons, and they have very, very useful civilian applications. And fusion is that way, too, I believe. Uh, and these are the officers. Don't worry about that. But you have to demonstrate, but you, know, you have to demonstrate ignition and gain laboratory. We're close, and it's still going to take another five or ten years before we do that. But then fusion energy is longer than that. You know, when I was doing NIF, as Dave said, many years ago, I would talk to Congress, and they'd say, what about energy? And I said, I just flew across the country in a 747, less than 100 years after the Wright brothers made an airplane. So look how much advance can take place in a relatively short amount of time. And uh, I was right, but I was the wrong way. I was looking back at the Wright brothers. Fusion is the Wright brothers. We have to get a plane that flies. You know, and this is the Wright flyer. And could they have ever imagined the 787? No. So fusion has to, this is NIF. Do you think an IFE plant will look like NIF but at higher rep rate? No, it will look something very different. But we have to do the physics and science of this. So fusion eventually, my son is uh, in his early 20s. I tell him he'll be 50 or 120, but he'll see fusion. You know, uh, and I'll say the same to you. So it's, you know, as uh, John Kennedy once said, on Earth God works must truly be our own. And so making fusion the way nature does is an enormous, enormous challenge but it is a way that will power the, the planet in the future sometime, and it will. And there's a quote I always like to use, you like history here. This is from Teddy Roosevelt. Better to dare many things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure. Believe me, I've had both. Uh, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they live in the dark, the gray twilight that knows neither victory or defeat. So hopefully you will go on and get your degrees, advanced degrees, you know, and get on to research. But take risks and have fun in the process. And Albert Einstein would agree with that. And that's, and that's my talk. So thank you.
questions? Do you have questions? Well, if you don't ask me questions, I'll ask you questions, so. <laughs> yes. So I, I'm glad to ask you and then the energy question. I'm yes. How, how do you, how would someone go about extracting energy from like a fusion reaction? No, it's, a, it's a good question. And so DT, so uh, what you would have to do, first of all, you'd have to fire these lasers or pulse power at somewhere about 1 to 10 hertz, depending on how, you, how much energy release per pulse. So when fusion happens, the, remember I said there's DT fusion, there's an alpha particle, which is a charged helium nuclei, which stays in the plasma and heats it up. It adds energy to the plasma. That's a critical feature for fusion because it's, ineff you, it's inefficient to get energy to the plasma. The plasma must heat itself. But then the other reaction product is a neutron. Neutrons are uncharged, and so they leave the, the, they leave the, fu the fusion plasma, and then they will deposit their energy into a wall that will heat, and it will heat it up. Most of the energy comes in the neutron. 14 MeV of the 17 is neutrons. So the wall will deposit energy. The neutron will deposit energy in a material, heat it up, and how clever I am to extract energy from that, from that in a conventional you know, fuel cycle. It also must breed tritium. So the wall must include, say, lithium, because tritium has to be bred in the fusion reaction, too. There are other fusion reactions that, you know, uh, that don't require this. There's the pro uh, hydrogen and boron, deuterium, and such. But they require much higher temperatures than uh, we do. So if you ask me, if we come back, I, had to, if I gave this talk 200 years from now, we'd probably be talking about a different fusion reaction than DT, but it will be the starting one we do. Yes? No, it's a good question because, you know, fusion, making the physics of fusion is, very, by now you see, it's really hard, all right? But making it economic, I will say, is even harder. <laughs> and so that, that means the time horizon for economic fusion uh, you know, energy is it's hard to say when it's going to be. It's surely outside the normal investment horizon of VCs and the like. But there are people, Gates is, you know, has, uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have, uh, break, they've started a fund called Breakthrough Energy, and they're beginning to invest in, in fusion. There are companies, there's a company in Southern California called Trialpha, which has raised over six, seven hundred million dollars of private money. So there's private money going into fusion. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what the motive is the motivation because they care about humanity or they think they're going to make a profit in five or ten years. I think it's the ones who care about humanity are doing it. So we, we, we talk to them uh, because there's, again, a lot of other applications. I do lasers, we do lasers. So there's lots of, lots of applications for the lasers we do here. Remember, NIF is 192 lasers, not just one laser, uh, omega-60 lasers. And so each one of these lasers by itself can do other things. You know, lasers are used ubiquitously in manufacturing right now. Uh, and so some of the technology that would be developed you know, in the pursuit of fusion from laser standpoint will end up in other applications, just like lithography. Never thought that would end up as a fusion application. So there is some of that. Uh, there's, most of, there's investment in MIT has started. They've raised money for a tokamak. Uh, yeah, there's, a, there's around five or six companies that are raising private capital. But I would not sell it for fusion in the grid in 10 years. <laughs> Let's say thank you again. And uh, <laughs> some of you have signed up for lunch after this. Uh, please come to room 128. Faculty members.